Okay, um, I want to talk this afternoon about something um, that's a little bit blunt and all, um, having to do with the gender wars and and, and um, you know claims of claims of oppression and, and the collectivist way of thinking about it. But I want to start rather bluntly with. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I'll start with a couple of pictures, just thematic pictures, and give you a clue. Um, here's a picture from the Military Museum in Columbia, South Carolina from 2015, and another picture. And you may get on to what I'm about to talk about, which is... the fact that um, we still have selective service registration. Um, you know, the draft ended in 1973, and I think the registration stopped in 75, and then it was restored in 1980 when Afghanistan ended, heated up. Um, and we've not had an active draft since then. People talked about it after 9-11, but we haven't really had one. Um, but there's a question. Um, on the Selective Service System site about whether a transgender or non-binary person is required to register. And the answer is that they have to register according if their sex assigned at birth, they say gender, but it's really sex assigned at birth, was male. And that's because of Congress. Congress has not changed it. There has been various proposals for example, to repeal Selective Service completely, which is, was active through 2022. It's not active right now. It was H.R. 2509 in the previous Congress. And um, there was an attempt, there was talk of requiring women to draft to register during the defense authorization bill but at the end of the term, but it did not happen. It's, they still are not required to register. And um, there is there was a case in 1981 about the requiring only of men, requiring men to register but not women, and the Supreme Court said it wasn't a violation of due process clause because women at the time weren't allowed to do everything in combat that men were, essentially. Although that's changed since then, women can now practically do everything. And it came up, it came up in court again, and the court said, well, we won't worry about it because Congress seems to be looking at it. But Congress hasn't really done very much. So there's a real question whether or not, um, whether or not we should repeal the ability to draft completely or whether we should keep it because in, uh, the world is the way it is and having a conventional having a conventional armed forces is sometimes thought of as a deterrent to nuclear war I um, mean and is thought to make us maybe look a little less vulnerable to a zero-sum game kind of situation that, you know, that maybe Putin right now is thinking about or something or that China could think about in the future or North Korea um, uh, so there is there is certainly a requirement for keeping it, and it also raises the question: Is if you got rid of the draft, should you replace it with something else, um, like national service? And would you ha would you um, maybe not make it absolutely compulsory because it would be a bureaucratic nightmare? But would you do something like? have a lot of carrots, um, offer a lot of tuition refunds or, you know, uh, or a lot of incentives and would you make it, would it sort of discourage young adults from starting out their own careers and businesses like some of them have on YouTube right now when they're 17 or 18 because they know that in, in a real world they're going to owe a year or two of service before they can really go, go out on the world with their own agency it would have a profound social effect. Maybe it would have a leveling effect and do something about the sense of inequality if we did. And I've wondered about that, but that's a profound question. But that then takes us back to thinking about 
the gender wars, and I recently read Helen Joyce's book, Trans, and I'm going to review it on blog, my blogs on WordPress pretty soon. But the, the underlying concern, and when, of course, we've always had transgender people go and do um, conversions as adults, and it's a relatively small number, and we've always supported it. And in fact, not only did we repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 2011 for gays in the military, later um, Biden removed most of the restrictions that Trump had tried to put in for transgender in the military and even intersex. Um, but we, as long as it was a very small number of people, and something that had happened infrequently, it wasn't thought of as a big deal. And I wasn't really very aware of the extent to which the, um, it was increasing among, among youth and teenagers and how it had been promoted in the schools until recently. And mainstream publications have looked at, made it look like it was a relatively benign thing. They really, I didn't really start hearing a lot about it until early maybe in 2022, about a little more than a year ago, and started getting more concerned. Um, but the big concerns are, um, maybe one of the biggest concerns is whether is whether you should get medication, puberty blockers, or something to, when they are when they um, are claimed gender dysphoria. That's increased, and now in Europe it's decreasing again. It's medically very questionable whether it's safe, in my opinion. Um, there are questions: should you? There are there have been a lot of pushes by the left to put the curriculum in the schools and introduce the concept of pronouns even in elementary grades in order to change attitudes about gender non-conforming people. Um, and um, I was rather surprised to find out how far this has gone. Um, and I, I wasn't even thinkable when I was substitute teaching. Now it's changed so much. Um, and um, I can sort of understand. I think the big, the other big thing, um, one thing is that if, for example, if you, even with the, there's also the question of parental approval and there's a question that radical people are, in, are in, you know, entering women's spaces, not only restrooms, but in women's sports and the, that the demands of trans activism is, a, is actually affecting other people and forcing them to sacrifice. And how it got this way, well, there's sort of a question, I guess, of hierarchy of oppression that many on the left have been convinced to believe that transgender youth, particularly as a group, are the most oppressed, even more than cis women or other groups. Um, it's, even, it's even kind of contradictory of the interests of ordinary gay men and women. Um, whether, it, I find it rather incredible, you know, I was, way behind physically as a male when I was growing up in the 50s and in today's situation it's entirely possible I would have been you know been led to the idea of stopping puberty and transitioning myself I wonder if I would have been sent down that track it seems like it's almost anti-gay in a sense it would rather see you have a gender identity as what as what you feel and then behave heterosexually with respect to gender identity or something it seems sounds regressive um, but that's one of the biggest concepts is particularly in Europe it's been is whether there should have to be a lot of medical evaluation and specific diagnoses for some before a child is considered transgender or whether just self-identification is enough and being lenient on self-identification is has real consequences, which I would be very concerned with. I think, the, um, particularly, uh, Colin Wright and Zach Elliott, um, reluctant Galilee's Last Stand, and then a group called I think the Paradox Institute, they pointed out that the idea of expecting of encouraging people to self-identify with a gender identity according to their behavioral inclinations when they're kids is actually regressive. And why not just let people be who they are, but let them understand they still have a, were born with a biological sex. And 99.9% .9 of the time, that is very clear what it is, and let them accept that. Isn't that simpler? 
And I would generally agree with that. However, I would kind of, I would also sort of caution you and, you know, what, thinking about what might have happened to me. When I was growing up, I was pressured to prove that I could be, you know, more physically powerful and could be in a position of protecting women and children if I had to. And that gets back to the draft, because men were being drafted and women weren't. You know, we had comp we had student deferments and so forth. That um, even if you did not um, cause a woman to become pregnant yourself, you you still should be. If you didn't marry and have children yourself, you should still be prepared culturally to participate in protecting women and children. And I, you can find videos online that say that today. So there there would be a lot of pressure on a young person in their original birth sex with the same gender identity to conform to that original gender if they didn't change. So I think it's, it would be nice if people were allowed to be who they are and not have to think about transitioning. And in fact, that was, that was the idea back in the 1970s with Paul Rosenfels at the Ninth Street Center um, and the polarity theory, which you you could have a you could be a perfect live perfectly normally in your biological gender as a man or a woman, but you could have a masculine or a feminine polarity, and it could be subjective or objective. But that was for personal growth purposes only. It was not for it was really not for public consumption. This is in the days before the internet, and it also was not for uh, it was also not to be used for political activism. It was a strictly a personal thing. And that's per that's my own interpretation of the most desirable way to handle this as an individual is to handle it more personally and not with political activism. So that's mainly what I have today. And um, again, um, th take seriously whether or not we should continue having conscription and whether men, women should be required, if we want to keep conscription, the possibility of having, we don't have an active draft now, but we could reinstate it if something happened. And in the Ukraine, all men between 18 and 60 were required to stay in the country and help defend it. And the women and children could flee and then uh, people in surrounding companies practically had to take them into their own homes. There wasn't very much of a choice about it. Um, and um, so around the world, you're seeing this is a real problem that it can come up. Um, so think seriously whether we should have um, something like, we should continue to have selective service registration at all, or should we expect women, biological women that is, to register? And should we, um, or should we have some sort of alternative service for which there's a lot of pressure that might have a leveling effect on society and might reduce some of the complaints about excessive privilege um, from the left if we did that. We would also interfere with a lot of opportunities for young people today. They wouldn't be able to start their sensational YouTube channels in their teens or something if they had to deal with this first. So I think it's a really touchy question. And thank you for listening.